So Andy White's a radiologist specializing in head and neck um, and maxillofacial radiology. He is uh, employed by Perth um, Radiology Clinic. He is also the clinical associate professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Western Australia. Um, Andy is qualified in dentistry and medicine and uh, initially trained as a double degree oral and maxillofacial surgeon in the UK and UCSF California before training in radiology in Wales. He then did a fellowship in head and neck radiology at um, UCLA, California. Um, and um, after living in South Australia for 10 years, he spent 15 years in uh, Western Australia before moving to Mornington Peninsula this year. His interests are family, history, and wine, and obviously <laughs> head and neck imaging. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thanks very much for the kind invite to come and speak. I love coming here. It's nice to get some refreshing weather. Um, and I kind of notice the sun comes out when um, we're sitting in this room. But no, it's great, and thank you again. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about imaging of carcinoma of the oral cavity and oropharynx. This is a subject which has changed quite a lot over the last five years. And um, I'll do my best to address some of the key points about the pathogenesis of the disease, the typical ulcerating SCC of the lateral tongue. So the role of imaging is to supplement physical examination because that underestimates the extent in all, all forms of the disease, superficial, deep and metastatic spread. And it's well documented that imaging improves the accuracy of staging and helps make the choice of treatment. So six most common cause of cancer 400,000 cases per year, predominantly SCC. And oral cancer is three times as common as oropharyngeal cancer, and it predominates in males. So as regards the etiology, smoking is well known, alcohol is well known, poor dental hygiene is well known, beetle nut chewing in certain parts of the world. And this peculiar activity is illustrated by a um, an ancient uh, Indian uh, re uh, relief dating from 2000 BC, which of course is related to this, um, it's not a sponge, it's an HPV virus, and that is significant. A diet rich in fruit and vegetables and good oral hygiene are factors which protect you against these cancers. As so regards the spread, mucosa and submucosa, direct invasion of surrounding structures, perineural tumour spread, and lymphatic and vascular. So regards nodal staging, this is the only time I'm going to talk about it. N1 is a node, a single node less than three centimetres. N2A, um, uh, nodes less between three to six. N2C greater than six with contralateral lymphadenopathy. Sorry, N2B less than six with multiple nodes. N2C, bilateral nodes, the C is contralateral, bilateral, however you want to remember it. And N3, where you get a single node greater than six centimetres in diameter. If you have one involved node, your survival goes down by 50% over five years, so it's highly significant. So regards the regions, the circumvallate papillae at the back of the tongue divide the oral tongue from the, um, the pharyngeal tongue. You have the buccal mucosa, you have the lip, you have the gingiva, this peculiar little area called the retromolar trigone, of which we'll talk, and these are the main areas of the oral cavity. As regards the anatomy, there's some key points. The mylohyoid muscle forming the muscular sling of the floor of the mouth, the genial muscles, the midline structures, the genioglossus, the geniohyoid, the hyoglossus muscle, which demarcates the lateral margin of the neurovascular bundle in the floor of the mouth of the sublingual space. The sublingual space demonstrated in green and the submandibular space by the white arrows lying below mylohyoid. So guys, the subsites, it's important to remember that 75% of carcinomas um, are lip, oral tongue and floor of mouth in decreasing frequency. And the lips by far the commonest and yet we do very little imaging of lip carcinoma unless it's uh, felt to have spread. Most of them are excised. T1, less than 2, T2, 
T2 between 2 and 4, T3 greater than 4 centimetres in diameter as the primary. T4 means it in, it's invasive and involves bone. And they divide it into T4A, which are bad, and T4B, which are very bad. And uh, we'll see some of the spread patterns of T4B later on. So the current tumour staging is, is inadequate. Everybody agrees that's just a question of how you change it. It should include tumour depth and volume. And this is where imaging will play a role, more of a role in the future. We know that the tongue and the floor of the mouth are biologically aggressive tumours with increased risk of metastatic disease and decreased survival. The retromolar trigone is also bad but not so common because it involves bone and it has a propensity for extensive soft tissue spread. All the other sites have better prognosis. So these are the bad ones, tongue, floor of mouth and retromolar trigone. So with small T, so less than T2 we call classify as small, no metastatic disease. Histology has shown us that if you have tumour budding of greater than five, uh, five buds per high power field and the depth of four millimetres, there it's a worse prognosis. So four millimetres is not actually a lot. So this is about a four millimetre tumour. You can see on post contrast CT. And again, this is a current article. So four millimetres uh, increased risk of recurrent disease with small tumours. The depth of invasion you can detect with CT, MRI, or ultrasound. And there are several studies comparing this with histology, and the imaging does very well. So post-contrast CT, post-contrast CT with narrow or mucosal windows, which I'll talk about. T2-weighted MR, the post gouda image, I apologise, this is from a colleague in Wales, and it's uh, not windowed correctly, but also shows the same thing as the T2. And ultrasound probably optimally demonstrates the depth of the tumour. And this has been written up, and it will be written up again uh, by my friends in Wales, uh, uh, Roger Evans and Rianne Rees, um, where they're going to compare CT and ultrasound and MR. They're doing this series at the moment. When it's advanced, if it crosses the midline, involves the tongue muscles, T4, depth of invasion, now 9 millimetres for the larger tumours is said to be critical. With increased risk of recurrence and decreased risk of survival, you can see a big tumour going across the midline. We can see metastatic lymphadenopathy, level 1B, uh, right level 2A. And these, uh, a lot of these tumours will still be treated by surgery. They may get uh, some radiotherapy, they may get chemo radiotherapy, but at some stage they're probably going to have surgery. And um, this is a hemiglossectomy specimen. So what's our checklist for the tongue? Depth of invasion? Four millimetres for T1, T2, nine millimetres for the larger tumours. Does it cross the midline? Does it involve the tongue base? Does it involve the floor of the mouth? And look for nodal metastases. They'll be there in 40% of cases, and they may skip a level in 15. So they may go straight to level three or level four. Now the root of the tongue or the floor of the mouth is that tissue on the ventral surface of the tongue that sort of um, unites it to the the anterior floor of the mouth, all that area should be considered as part of the same region. It's that triangular in shape on the sagittal. And we can see um, both on post contrast CT and probably more clearly on MRI um, an enhancing ulcerating tumour involving the anterior floor of the mouth. Now, these tumours commonly involve bone, you can see in this case involving the mandible, T4, and it's obstructing the submandibular salivary gland ducts on the right and to a lesser extent the left because it's blocking the meati and that's what they look like clinically. Now submucosal spread, midline crossover, we've discussed extensive bone erosion. This is T4B because it's involving the infraalveolar canal and the incisive canal and it, it's involving a nerve, the infraalveolar nerve, the mental nerve, so it's got a propensity for perineural tumour spread and a difficult surgical proposition. Small primaries, okay, quite often difficult to see on CT, particularly if you have filling artifact, but extensive metastatic lymphadenopathy in levels 1B and 2A, and uh, an involved level 2B node on your left, on the patient's left, and on the patient's right, a reactive appearing lymph node. The sublingual space is that space above myelohyoid, and medial to high glossus. Um, 
and uh, lateral to with the genial muscles. It contains the sublingual salivary gland and the neurovascular bundle, and we can see the asymmetry on CT and MR. This is a minor salivary gland tumour, so 50% of these tumours are minor salivary gland, commonest being adenoid cystic, Mrs. adenoid cystic, um, propensity for perineural tumour spread. Here we see the tumour on MR. Here we're seeing it spreading back along the left lingual nerve towards the infraalveolar foramen and the main trunk of V3. So the floor and mouth checklist. Bone, commonly, it's placid up against the bone, involves the periosteum, may involve the sublingual space and the neurovascular bundle, commonly crosses over. It may go to the tongue base, not so common may breach mile hide go into the submental or submandibular spaces. And remember, nodal metastases are common, particularly submental level 1A and level 1B. Now the retromolar trigone is that mucosa distal to the lower third molar. And it's the crossroads of the oropharynx, the oral cavity, the nasopharynx and the buccal space. So there's buccinator, there's the raphe, the superior pharyngeal constrictor, all these things uh, are attached to that white line of the raffe, uh, my arrow, sorry. Um, I must have had too much wine when I put that arrow in, but it should be there, okay. So again, can be subtle on CT. And you've got to know what you're looking at. You, hopefully you'll get some clinical details apart from please bulk bill. Um, so <laughs> bony scalloping, retromolar fossa, the tumor spreading, and we'll talk about a technique uh, later on for helping you visualise these tumours. And you see how it's spreading obliquely along the pharyngeal constrictor and the togo mandibular raphe. It's going up that little white line. So it can go north, it can go uh, posteriorly, it can go anteriorly, it can go inferiorly. They're bad news. This is what big boys look like. And see how aggressive this is. This is a T4B. It's involving bone. It's involving deep fascial spaces, the oropharynx. And, you know, before you think, oh, MR is the answer to all your prayers, the image on your right illustrates why MR might be difficult in these patients. They've got big tumours, they don't like lying on the back, they swallow, and you get mo motion artefact. Good quality CT is always your best starting point. Um, level 1B nodes, you see, uh, and, you know, it's, they're difficult tumours for everybody. Uh, multiple routes of spread. So the retromolar phygone trigone checklist, bone erosion, cortex and marrow. CT is better for the cortex, MR is better for the marrow, but MR will overestimate the extent of tumour spread because of reactive and inflammatory change. So you'll get changes on T1, T2 post-GAD, which are not necessarily tumour. So mucosal spread, it's complex as we see multiple routes, perineural invasion, we've got to do MRI with GAD and FATSAT, and nodal metastases, frequent 50% of cases. So the less common tumours, the better prognosis tumours. Buccal mucosa, they're relatively low grade histologically. We see it beautifully on the CT, spreading into subcutaneous fat. Um, it's also spreading into buccinator. Gingival or mucosa, they can overlie the mandible or the maxilla. They can invade bone as in this case. And this is T4, it's just reaching the infraalveolar canal. So technically, it's a T4B tumour. Okay, here's another T4 tumour. This in itself, it's involving the sinus, that's T4A. There's extensive bone destruction. We'll see it coming back into the medial pterygoid muscle. Um, and a similar tumour where we see T1 and post-GAD fats at T1, the tumour enhances and we can see it growing up the greater palatine nerve. So this is T4B, because it's got perineural tumour spread. So the checklist for these tumours, submucosal spread, bone erosion, again, CT and MR, good combo. Perineural tumour spread, um, MR is much better than CT, obviously. And nodal metastases, CT is still our preference. So oral carcinoma, your, your treatment options, um, predominantly surgical. Um, particularly if it's involving bone, uh, but radiotherapy and chemotherapy have a definite role as this combination therapy. So here's our tumour that we showed earlier of a large gingival buccal sulcus mucosa tumour eroding bone. 
that's what you look like post-surgical. You've got, um, was involved in the infralvular canal, so the patients had an on-block resection, reconstruction with bone graft, and a fixation plate, concurrent neck dissection, and post-operative radiotherapy, standard treatment option. Um, that's quite nice. I don't live there anymore, so I can't really say how nice it is, but it's beautiful. It's the best beach in the world if you ever get to visit the southwest part of WA. Aura pharynx, uh, the anatomy will go through imaging checklists and the clinical relevance of the imaging findings. Now, the anatomy is not difficult. The palate, draw a line under the anterior arch of C1, join those up. Okay, that's your nasopharynx above. Draw a line through the either the inferior margin of the vellecular or the top of the hyoid bone. Draw a line through the junction, the posterior nasal spine, the back of the bony palate. So the pharynx is behind, the oral cavity is in front, and then the hypopharynx is a bit below. Okay, so in terms of anatomy, tongue base, the vellecular, between the tongue base and the epiglottis, the tonsil, lying in the um, t uh, tonsillar uh, recess or sulcus, and demarcated by the anterior pillar and the posterior pillar. So in terms of MR, okay, you have a number of spaces as demarcated by Hansberger. The pharyngeal mucosal space, which is really the pharynx and the muscle. The parapharyngeal space, the fat. The carotid space containing the lower cranial nerves, internal jugular vein and internal carotid artery. The masticator space, muscles of mastication, mandible and V3. So I'm only going to talk about the tonsil and tongue base because of time, and really they're by far and away the commonest lesions. And this is the one where our philosophy and treatment's changing. So the subsites, this is what you see when you look in the mouth in schematic form. We're looking at the lateral recess of the palatine tonsil and the adjacent lingual tonsil. You can't always separate them, you can't separate tumours there, and functionally they're the same tissue anyway. So the risk factors, alcohol and smoking as before, and mutation of a tumour suppressor gene. HPV infection now is thought to be the causative factor in 70% of cases, as compared with 17 in the 80s. It's related to HPV 16 in 95%, and your risk is proportional to your number of oral sex partners. Marijuana use is a, an, uh, an additive factor when you're HPV positive. And the tonsil is the commonest oropharyngeal carcinoma subside. Now they tend to present late. Um, well, they did in the old days. Now they might present with a nodal mass, but previously if you've got a big tumour, otalgia, referred pain, throat pain, or as an asymptomatic and nodal mass. And again, emphasise the HPV infection. So if you look at the incidence, there's an epidemic. And in about four years' time, it's going to overtake cervical carcinoma. And probably would have done even without the use of the vaccine. Okay, so the overall incidence is rising. The cases due to HPV negative are going down. And the cases, cases due to HPV positive are rising dramatically. The reason why they occur in this region is because of the tonsillar crypts. They increase the surface area for the viruses to um, uh, get into the submucosa, and you have a leaky basal epithelium and basal lamina, allowing the um, viruses to penetrate into the tissue and incite an immune response. So in schematic terms, you get infection. The virus is very good at e evading the local immune system, gets into cells you express viral oncogenes, you undergo cellular transformation, genetic alteration, which leads to malignancy. So when we look at the anatomy, we've already discussed this. We have the tonsil, the variable amount of lymphoid tissue, lateral oropharyngeal wall with an anterior pillar and posterior pillar, which we can see on imaging. And you note the close relationship to the tongue base, and then the posterior pharyngeal wall and pharyngeal constrictor and our friend, the pterygomandibular raphae. <coughs> so this is how they may present, particularly the HPV positive patients with a cystic nodal mass. Here's metastatic SCC. Here's a branchial cleft cyst, a second branchial cleft cyst. 
beware about calling things second branchial cleft cysts, particularly in the 35 to 45 age group. Now, occult primary PET is definitely proving a great value in seeing the primary lesion. You, you know where it is, it's gonna be in the tonsil now. You might look at this tongue basin, mm, that looks angry, and it does. There's the metastatic node, which is partially necrotic. We've got a lot of activity at the tongue base, but it's entirely symmetric, and it's exactly where you expect the lingual tonsil to be. And that's where the primary is. It's in the palatine tonsil, and it's a small primary, which we can't see on CT, and you wouldn't see it on MR either. So, again, there's our small primary on our nodal met. This is what many of the our older patients with HPV negative present as when they get otalgia or throat pain, they get a big infiltrating mass which may go anteriorly into the tongue base or the buccal space, medially, sorry, laterally into the masticator space, posteriorly into the carotid space or the prevertebral space, and that's what's left of the internal carotid artery, the circumferential tumour um, encasing the vessel. This is a T4B. Okay, this is a recurrence shown on CT. You know, you, you know there's tumour there, but it's hard to see any boundaries. It's growing up through Fram Novali into Meckel's Cave and the cavernous sinus. This denovation edema of the lateral muscles of mastication. When we give GAD, we can show the horrific extent of the tumour. So another case. We can see it going in multiple directions. The more you look, the more you see. Okay, we've got bilateral metastatic nodes. I mean, MR is, is vastly superior for showing the extent of these tumours, but I still feel that CT is your baseline and certainly optimal for me for staging the neck uh, along, uh, along with PET. Tonsillolingual sulcus is that little cleft between the anterior pillar of the palatine tonsil and the postural aspect of the tongue. And tumours can hide in here, so they're halfway between tongue base and palatine tonsil. Uh, again, I've used mucosal windows, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we can see the tumour um, on PET. We can see the hypertrophy of the lingual tonsil at the tongue base. So this tissue is not tumour, it's symmetric, that's normal activity in a hypertrophied lingual tonsil. Remember, a lot of these patients may be smokers and drinkers, mouth breathers, and this tissue tends to get inflamed. And there's our metastatic node. You can see all the nodes are sub seven millimetres, and one of them at least is involved. So our checklist, submucosal extension, tongue base invasion, encasement, we we'll make it a T4B or perineural tumour, Bone erosion, pterygoid plates make it a T4B. And nodal metastases, common. And they tend to be cystic in the HPV cases. So the tongue base, really consider it in the same breath as the lingual tonsil. This is a patient who, with two levels, this is a patient who's had radiotherapy, their lingual tonsils enhancing following radiotherapy. And uh, we can see uh, what the lingual tonsil looks like. So it should be symmetric. You shouldn't have asymmetric extension on one side into the deeper tissues. If you do, think of tumour. The structure is identical to the tonsil. The crypts, the leaky basal epithelium, and try not to confuse these cases with carcinoma. You could confuse it with a lymphoma, and quite, quite rightly, you would have to say that that would be in your differential. This is a 45-year-old who's got gross hypertrophy of um, their lingual tonsil, and their, but their, the palatine tonsils and the adenoids are also enlarged as well. So really this is a reactive process or lymphoproliferative disorder. Small primary again, likely HPV. Asymmetric hypertrophy of where the lingual tonsil would be, it also looks a little bit necrotic on post-contrast CT. Okay, there's our metastatic node. And there's our lesion on PET CT. So MR is optional for tongue base, can be very, very useful. But I, you know, I think as with the HPV cases, um, probably not so useful these days unless you're actually contemplating surgery or salvage surgery. 
So um, T2 fat sat, post GAD CT, the extension to the midline, the extension posteriorly to the um, palatine tonsil. It's T4, it's involving tongue musculature, so it's T4. Metastatic nodes in 60%, bilateral in 30%, there's our tumour. Metastatic nodes on both sides of the neck. Midline crossover, again, involvement of tongue musculature, T4, and multiple metastatic um, nodes, all less than um, six centimetres in size, N2B, no contralateral nodes. That's a reactive node with fat and hyalus. Okay, N2B. So the checklist, the extension, they can spread widely, involving the neurovascular bundle, midline crossover, and nodal metastases are common. They're advanced at presentation. So if we compare the HPV positive and negative, HPV tends to be younger, HPV older, sorry, HPV negative older. HPV positive tend to be smaller presentation, they tend to be well defined, and they may have cystic metastases which may mimic a branchial cleft cyst, and they have a much better prognosis, although they do have an increased risk of late uh, recurrence or other primaries developing because of the field effect. And HPV increasing in incidence. Again, we talked about size, same as oral cavity really, um, T1, T2, T4, and T4, the division between advanced and very advanced in A and B subclassifications. So the T stage is directly proportional to the risk of recurrence. Current treatment, small, likely HPV positive. They normally do a tonsillectomy because that's where most of them are and they get chemo rads. Okay, large, likely HPV negative, chemo rads to shrink the tumour down, plus or minus surgical salvage. So surgical salvage, this is recurrent tumour after chemo, sorry, residual tumour after chemo rads. This is planning uh, on block resection and neck dissection. Surgical specimen uh, delivered, hemiglossectomy, partial pharyngectomy, um, and yeah, it's not pretty. So just to finish up with a few words on imaging, I still, well, Gavin, I, Rudolph, we, we still feel that CTs are basic in, in investigation, but you have to do it correctly. Multi-detector scanners have created a lot of problems in a lot of ways because we tend to scan too early with regard to our contrast bolus. So, uh, you know, 256 dual energy, it's a different language. Important things are contrast infusion, timing, quiet breathing and no swallowing. You mustn't breath hold either. And then EMR, good magnet, good sequences, good patient, good tech. Just 3T preferably 1.5 is fine. Uh, we use ultrasound guided FNAC for equivocal nodes and obviously PET's got an increasing role. Leighton, the puff cheek technique, very useful in oral cancer. Got an oral cavity tumour, if they actually tell you They've got a tumour in the oral cavity rather than police bolt fill. It's very helpful. So these are another retromolar trigone carcinoma with the oral cavity distended with air. And if you're not confident you don't want to do the whole thing with air, you can do this at the end uh, of your sequence. Just do, a, a, um, just do your next study, come back and just do a delayed study just through there or do the whole thing with puff cheeks. Some people can do it quite easily. Some people find it incredibly difficult. So there's... Um, there's a beautifully demonstrated retromolar trigone tumour. Slow infusion, 100 mils at 1 mil per second, and start scanning at 100 seconds. Most people scan way too early, okay? You've got to give the time for the tumour to enhance. And the, the Bible really of neck cancer imaging is Bob Herman's book from, from um, Belgium. Mucosal windows were written up by Christine Glastonbury and point to these narrow window widths for showing um, mucosal enhancement in tumour. They, they are useful and we have a preset on our monitors that allow us to switch on and look at them. The incidence of nodal disease um, is common from both but more common with oropharynx. And if nodes are equivocal, ultrasound guided FNA. PET CT, it's not always simple you know, we've learned that with our experience. We co-report our PET-CTs with our, with our, um, 
our primary nuclear medicine physicians all had neck cancer cases co-reported. And we've learned a lot and they've learned a lot as well. So nodal metastases, big fat link, your tonsil. This is similar to the case you saw early, mucosal windows, we can't see anything in the tonsil. There's our hypertrophied lingual tonsil, which is reactive, and there's our primary site. We see these not uncommonly. Here's another case, staging and follow-up. Initial staging, this is a big T4 tumour, HPV negative, N2B. Okay, nodes, it's going down into the uh, tongue base and the follicular. Following chemo rads, looks really good on the follow-up PET CT, but by four months later, we have a massive recurrence in the um, right, right where the primary was in the tonsil or lingual sulcus palatine tonsil. So for optimal Im imaging, you need clinical details. You have to establish a rapport with your clinician. You need the right scan protocol. I, I don't think anybody seriously looks at, at film anymore in reporting these cases. If you do, well, sorry. Bone and mucosa windows. Um, you know, dental status is important, not just, and bone erosion is important, not just from the point of view of seeing if there's erosion by tumour, but also if there's diffuse dental disease, you know, this is going to be influence your chemo radiation status. You know, don't just say, oh, advise an OPG, dental pathology, please see films or whatever. You can see it much better on recons from, from um, a multi-text CT. You can get the text to reformat on bone windows on every case. Okay, and TNM staging, apply that. You have to know your anatomy. You have to understand the pathology and the patterns of spread, treatment options, maximize your imaging resources, collaborate both with nuclear med and with your, with your physicians. Joint meetings are ideal. And know what you get right and what you get wrong. And lastly, be careful what you put in your mouth.